All right. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Berman Hale, and I am here with Jamie Indigo. Uh, we actually work together at Deep Crawl, the professional services team, which is awesome. I used to work with Jamie years ago. Very excited she's joined the team, and I get to work with her again, which also means we get to wrangle her into more and more webinars. So Jamie, who has been in the SEO scene for a long time, whose specializations and ways that she saved my professional life have been around JavaScript and deep rendering and performance, uh, has agreed to come on and redo um, a talk that was given at Deep Crawl Live that was popular, right? Everyone wanted to see copies of the slides. People wanted to see it as a standalone. So we're really happy to snag her for this one. Um, what you can expect from this morning, Jamie's gonna talk a little bit about uh, the new core web vitals in terms of what the evolution of uh, the page experience SEO and UX has been to why core web vitals have been integrated. She'll do a break, uh, uh, sorry, a breakdown of the other elements. So mobile, interstitial, security, et cetera, before doing a real deep dive into core web vitals, including how to fix and win things. All right. Um, I'm sure that you do not need me talking anymore. Here we all can hear Jamie speak. Jamie, how are you doing this morning? Good morning, sunshine, and good morning, lovely humans who have all joined us today. Thank you for coming on back, or maybe it's your first time. Hopefully, this will be something at least entertaining, because I've met me and Ashley. We can make it at least entertaining. <laughs> awesome. All right. Teach us everything. I am Teach you all the things? Yeah. All right. You ready? Ready? Right. On your mark? Get set. So the title of this talk is When SEO Meets UX. And I had a friend rightfully give me a little bit of guff about this, going, um, you think this is where it starts? Like UX and SEO, we've been uh, pretty strongly interlinked before now. Um, it's not wrong until um, pre-May 2020, we knew that mobile-friendly, safe browsing, HTTPS and intrusive interstitials were all signals for page experience. They were all things that while SEOs didn't directly control, we knew would impact us. They would provide insights for us on these issues in Google Search Console. I mean, it's not anything really that new. SEO has always been about the sum of the parts. So the difference is in May 20, 2021, we're going to see three new pieces added into page experience for our users and as a ranking signal. And these are gonna be our web core vitals. So why the inclusion? Well, did you know you have eight seconds of your user's attention on a screen to get them to complete a task? Eight seconds. We don't spend very long, especially on a mobile device, waiting for our questions to be answered, particularly if there's a whole cert back there of other pages willing to answer our questions. Fundamentally, the web is for humans and real humans want real good experiences. And when sites pass the core vitals assessment, users are 24% less likely to abandon that page load. That's a big win for you. It's a big win for Google. It's a big win for your users. Everybody gets cake. So why group these particular components together? Well, they're all handled by Chromium. Chromium actually announced the core vitals. They came out with it before webmasters and anyone else said, hey, we're gonna push this across to all of Google. And that's because Google uses this complex series of interconnected systems to build search. We like to think of Googlebot as this giant monolithic beast. In actuality, Googlebot's the user agent that makes a request. The web rendering service that builds a page together, that actually is Chromium. So our agendas today, we're gonna to break down the signal components. We're gonna look at how to win them, deep dive into those web core vitals, how to improve on them, and a little bit on how this ranking signal is gonna work. All right, you ready? Let's do this. First off, mobile friendly, SEO friends since 2016. None of you can be surprised about this. None of you, none. <laughs> we have the mobile friendly test, it's out there saying, hey, your tap targets are ridiculous. Please make those better. There's even the mobile usability report in Search Central. And Google documentation has uh, updated and in a little bit of collaboration with CMSs like WordPress, Drupal, Wix, Squarespace to actually make 
specific guides for those CMSs, which is beautiful. SEO solutions rarely one size fits all. So how do we pass this? We use compatible plugins. That's a big one. We all want gadgets and gizmos of plenty on our site because they're fun and they're pretty. But if they're not mobile friendly, they're just annoying. We want to make sure we have our viewport, viewport defined. So that is to say, how big of a screen am I going to make this content for? And we wanna make sure that the canvas we're painting everything on matches that viewport. I wanna have it sized to that with elements that are the right size. No one likes YouTube because of that skip ad video, skip video button, skip ad button being the size of an ant, <laughs> a very pesky, very agile ant that you can never quite seem to tap and close. Same idea goes for your site, except your site probably isn't owned by Google, so you're not gonna get away with that. Intrusive interstitials. No one loves these, and they've been penalizing the annoying with Google search penalties since 2017. This impacts rankings, not indexing. So you can still be indexed with that monstrosity covering your entire page, but your rankings will change because of it. If it's difficult or impossible to close, like that X in the corner is a lie, I have to wait for a timeout in order to close the content. It's unresponsive. It joins the party without being asked. These are all signs that it's a problematic interstitial. Um, there are some scenarios where it's okay to have these. Basically, anytime legal requires it, it's going to be all right. If you need to accept cookies, have an age verification, you're good. Things for uh, content not intended to be indexed, that there's private content, things behind authorization, um, going to be okay. Dismissible banners, good, fantastic alternative. You can do those, hey, download my app. You can even have a page to page interstitial saying, you know, maybe we're taking you off site and we'll make sure you're aware. These are all fine things. We know for sure that if you're using something that is from a product side argued as valuable and useful, like a geolocation or language interstitial, that's still going to be penalized. Anything like a responsive scroll box, a welcome mat, any kind of vague random terms you want to give to the thing that popped up without being invited and can't be dismissed, still an interstitial. There are some gray areas. These are ones where we don't have a penalty to them yet. And that's mostly because of how Chromium works. It's gonna try and render that full DOM and it's gonna stop. It's not gonna hang around on a page for two minutes to go ahead and trigger any of these. You're not gonna see a, a tap or an interaction that might give us some of these sidebars like a, a related posts, sticky sidebars, share buttons. I'm okay with coupons. You can offer me a coupon, not on a full page in an annoying way, but sure. Any kind of interactions like a intent to leave there's no penalty for that yet, but please, again, be careful because the user is trying to leave your site because they couldn't find what they need. And then you come on real strong going, please don't leave me. It's not a good look. How do we pass this? Use banners. Banners are great. They're small, they're at the top. They're not as intrusive. You can create interstitials in a way that still allow search engines to see the content. So if you are required to have an age verification gate you can do that. Just make sure that content of the page is fully available in the rendered HTML. You can use tools like the URL inspector or mobile friendly test to ensure that content is there behind. And we want to make sure that renders without a required interaction. If a user has to allow permissions or tap Googlebot doesn't interact. It doesn't allow permissions. So that content isn't going to be available to a search engine. If you're not sure if it's an interstitial because somebody put a really fun name on it, like a responsive scrolling welcome mat, it's probably still an interstitial. Safe browsing is all of our friends. This aspect of the ranking signal is designed to keep you your site and your users all safe. If your site has been impacted by malware, you want to know this. You want to keep your users trust. 
So we have six different alerts available to us from Search Console, malware, deceptive pages, harmful downloads, uncommon downloads, deceptive sites, unwanted software. Again, if any of these are lurkers are on your site, this is going to fundamentally undermine users' trust in your ability to keep their information safe. And if your business model is based on users providing personal information, like a credit card, they're not going to do that. How do we win at this? We understand vulnerabilities. That's not a static thing. You don't have a perfect future of an invulnerable site. New threats constantly arise, new challenges constantly arrive, but you can always have backups ready. You can always have a rollback plan. What happens if your site does have malicious software? Do you have a way of keeping your content available so you could quickly deploy it to the site while you work to understand how it got there and what to do? Unique logins for every password. Don't reuse them. This is actually the number one way that your site could be compromised. You've used that password on another site. That information was compromised. Here we are, bad times. Be judicious with who you give admin privileges. Not everyone needs to be an admin. Not everyone should be an admin. Keep your servers up to date. A lot of times, especially smaller sites, those working with WordPress or a plug and play CMS instance, don't necessarily pay attention to uh, changes to the latest version of PHP or anything else on their servers. These are important. Learn how to spot a data leak. So when you log errors in your console, that information could actually be captured and used by malicious parties. One of the biggest ways your site could be compromised is by a plugin. So you are only as secure as your weakest asset. If you are using a third party plugin, vet them. Make sure their security is sound. If you're not using a plugin, remove it. Ashley and I back in the day had a really fun game of playing spot the sneaky redirect and it would only happen under certain conditions. And what happened was uh, this site had a plugin that was no longer in use. The maker of the plugin actually stopped supporting it. They even gave up on their own domain. Someone came in, bought that domain, made a new script bundle using the exact same one that thousands of sites already called on and exploited that vulnerability. Know, know where you can be weak. You're never gonna be perfect. Have a rollback plan. Safe browsing is good for all of us. <laughs> Next up in our signal is security. And the fact we went without this until 2016 is absolutely terrifying. I firmly believe that we are gonna look back at web security as we approach it today. in the same way we look back at DNA evidence and you know those hard world detectives of the 1920s. You've got, ah, you've got that private eye and the fedora brooding and skulking and the detective is telling him how the killer's blood is in the wall and the private eye is going, ew, gross, clean that up. Like we don't understand what we're leaking, what we're losing, what we're potentially compromising. So we all need encryption. We all need data integrity and authentication. And these things protect our website and our users and the communication between the two of us. No one can listen in, no one can track. Our data is sound. We're not getting, uh, corrupted transfers, data being modified. We wanna make good decisions with good data. We want everyone involved in trusting and interacting with our site to believe they can do so with confidence. How do we pass this? We use robust security certificates. If your site does not currently use SSL, you can go to certbot.eff.org and they provide those for free wonderful tool. Thank you, Electronic Freedom Foundation. We always want to use server-side 301 redirects to go ahead and resolve content to secured versions. We don't want to block or secure pages with robots.txt or robust tags. We only ever use secure content on secure pages. Similarly to how we treated our plugins, same idea. We can use the URL inspection tool to make sure all the content is available and accessible. If you have an option to use HSTS, please do. This says, hey, I know a request was made, an internal link had a non-secure protocol on it, 
but I'm going to go ahead and enforce a secure protocol. It's your friend. Make sure all the content on your site in both secure and non-secure versions match. Worked with a lot of clients throughout the years who only verified that one version of the site that they believe to be the primary variation. Well, the nooks and crannies are where strange things form. If you have every variation verified, you have insights into perhaps a mobile version, a non-secure, playing differently, having something like a sneaky redirect that you wouldn't be able to see on other versions. All right, now the fun part, now we're here, because all of the other guys, they've been around, they're not that new, but Web Core Vitals, these are new, these are shaking things up. They are a unified form of measurement. This is across Google products. This is amazing. Beforehand, it was every testing tool was possibly a little bit different and may possibly mean for a lot. You didn't know exactly how to reconcile the Web Core Vitals in the new White House test version six are already 55% of your performance score. These components uh, and their respective weights are going to revolve, revolve, going to evolve. And you can read that as they will change at any time for any reason. We're gonna meet the three components of our web vitals. They're used to measure a human centric experience. So loading is measured by largest contentful pane. It is the time that it takes that screen to give me the content I am there for, so my thumb stops hovering over the back button. Interactivity, can I tap and do a thing? If I tap it, does it seem like the button's broke? What's happening here? Can I even buy something on this page? And visual uh, stability is measured by that cumulative layout shift. Shift is very important. I know we've all been to a website. You're like, oh, the thing I wanted, and you tap on it, and then the whole page shifted, and somehow you've opened another weird ad, and life just isn't great that way. And um, these images, of course, are from Deep Crawl's Guide to Web Core Vitals. Recommend you guys check that out after. There are multiple ways to measure these. They are uniform across all of these tools. And when you go to measure, it's important to know how you measure. Not all means of measurement do the same thing. So we have field data, and that is data collected from real life humans in the wild. It's also known as real user monitoring or RUM. And then we have lab data. So this is data that's performed in a controlled environment with predefined devices and network settings. So your dev pod over there, they all have the same Wi-Fi. They all have the same tools. It's not going to mirror the numerous variables that humans out in the wild are gonna experience. This is why we also call lab data emulated data. Field data has really great use cases. It's strong at letting us know what real humans are experiencing. It can help us correlate performance to business metrics. And ultimately it's gonna be the key part of this ranking signal. When you look into Search Console and you see that data, that is from the Crux report, that is from our real user metrics. It does have weaknesses as well. So restricted metrics. We don't get a lot of data with field data. We need to protect users' anonymity, of course. And you can't really debug based on a third-party experience. Developers need reproduction steps in order to fix a problem. Simply how it goes. Lab data also has a strength, and it happens to be for your dev team, for those who are working to debug these performance issues. We get end-to-end -end visibility into the UX. We can see frame by frame each piece of that screen painted. We can reproduce these. It's wonderful. It doesn't capture real-world bottlenecks, though, and they might not necessarily correlate to real-world KPIs. We've all had that moment where someone goes, it works on my machine. This is why lab data is unique to that setup. If you're on network in the office, yeah, you might get a much better experience than somebody who's using a mobile device on 3G. How do we win at these things? We know what they are. How do we make them better? Well, largest contentful paint, it represents that loading experience. And each of these new metrics has an exact measurement. So this one is the point on the page when the largest block of images or text is visible in the viewport. So we know how to define it. We know what it's meant to measure. We also can then infer that it typically will be the same per page template. 
which means <clears throat> that when it comes to making these things better, rather than working on a per page basis, we can do it on a template basis. Pretty great, cuts down the number of tickets that you're gonna have to put on in. Um, we can use Chrome Dev Tools, which is gonna be another lab data, to see exactly where this occurs. So if we open up Chrome Dev Tools, we navigate to the timing section in that performance panel, there's actually markers in here. And if you hover over them, you'll see exactly which node Respond, uh, correlates to that. You can have, no more guesswork, a clear definition of what LCP is for that page or template. We have goals. All of these have goals. And we want 75% of page loads to achieve that largest contentful paint in under 2.5 seconds. That gives us that fast passing grade. That's when we get all three of these metrics in fast passing grades, how we reduce the abandonment rate by 24%. That little 75% word is a little bit big, so let's dive over there real quick. That means that 75% of pages hit the good threshold. It also means conversely, if 25% hit poor, your site has a poor threshold. So it's never a one-off. It's in all of these page loads, do 75% of them have a good experience? We have some causes of poor LCP. Typically it's one of these four, slow server response times, render blocking resources, resource loading times, or client-side rendering. Each of them is gonna have a different fix. So ultimately we're back to the world of, well, it depends. So if you've got a slow server response time, look at optimizing your server, look at using a CDN, cache those assets. Googlebot's already being very, very aggressive with caching, but humans aren't. So when you have that max, max age tag, Googlebot's going to ignore that. They're gonna look for a 304 or an if modified header instead. We want to serve our HTML pages cache first. And if you've got a third party who's contributing very important content, say your CDN or a font, do a pre-connect. Make sure that connection is established and ready to go to get this content available to a user. If our cause of poor LCP is from render blocking, let's minify and defer everything that's not critical. If we can inline this critical CSS, so any CSS that is necessary to build the content above the fold of the page. Inline that. We're going to defer, compress, minify everything else. We no longer need polyfills for Googlebot, which is great news, because that was some clunky code. Minimize it. If you're not using it, don't load it. If you have slow resource time, make sure you're loading the right size the right size image for the page, for the device that's calling it. You wanna compress these as well. There is no need to uh, send more bytes that are really gonna be useful to anyone. Preload those important resources, compress your text files, um, serve different size assets. So don't serve an image meant for a desktop user if that user's on a mobile device. Ultimately, that means they're gonna take that massive image and shrink it down really small, which is more time blocking them from engaging with your content. And we can always cache assets using service workers. If you've got client-side rendering issues, please stop doing that. Stop client-side rendering. It's not a good time for anybody. But you can minimize your critical JavaScript. You can use server-side rendering, or you can use pre-rendering. Next up, our first input delay. So this is only available as field data. This is only available as metrics recorded for real users in real life. It's designed to measure responsiveness to user input. So my page loaded, I see that buy button for the thing that I wanna buy. Why isn't it working? Why is, is this button real? Not experience. And there's a very, again, clinical definition to how it works. It's time from that tap to that tap resolving. This is what that looks like. So on the bottom there, you see browser receives first user input. That is me or any other human tapping that button. And where the bar ends, the browser responding to my input. If that main thread, the thing that would respond to my request as a user is busy executing so many pieces of silly script, it can't respond to me, the user. 
if you're going to check this for uh, your lab data, which inevitably you will, that's how your devs will troubleshoot, use total blocking time instead. Measures the same thing and instead looks at task length. So each script task will take a certain amount of time. If that task takes longer than 50 milliseconds, the amount of time over that is the blocking time. My task took 70 milliseconds, that's 20 seconds of blocking time. They have different goals, but they correlate very strongly, which means they're fantastic. Just know what you're measuring for. If you're looking to get that passing score for a first input delay, you want it under 100 milliseconds. If you're measuring in your lab data, under 300 milliseconds of total blocking time. What causes poor first input delay? JavaScript. Sorry guys, that's it. <laughs> as long as that JavaScript is heavy and occupying the main thread, you're gonna have a poor FID. How do we fix it? Well, we break up long tasks. Instead of bundling five tasks together without taking a breath, without taking a beat, let's break them into smaller components. Let's say instead of four tasks shoved into uh, 250 milliseconds, I have four independent tasks broken out into 60 milliseconds a piece. We want to optimize the page to respond to the user first. I don't want my main thread to be working and loading stuff uh, below the fold, on the footer, when the user, the reason this page exists, is trying to interact with it now. We can use web work workers. We can reduce our JavaScript execution time. And the majority of the time JavaScript is spent uh, parsing and compiling because we have this habit of going, we'll just ship this script on every page. It doesn't matter if anyone's using it, we're just gonna ship it anyway. And that adds up, that is heavy. So if you're not using the script on that page, don't ship it. That means your main thread's gonna spend less time waiting for nonsense that's not even used on the page to be finished and more time letting your user complete the task, the reason they came here. Again, you have eight seconds to let them complete that task. Cumulative layout shift. This guy is actually the smallest um, of the web core vital weighting so far. So both largest contentful paint and first input delay, TBT and Lighthouse, they are both 25% of that Lighthouse version six score. This guy is 5% itty bitty. And this is gonna change. This is 5% right now because we're still figuring it out. This guy's a bit of a complicated thing. So it's meant to represent the visual stability. And it's the strange calculation of how much moves and how far it moves. We end up with this unique number at the other side of it. If we have a score of less than 0 0.1, we've earned that fast. And that means minimal things changed. And when they did, they didn't move very far. If you had an itty bitty thing that moved a very far distance, it's gonna score higher. If you have a large thing that shifts a little bit, it's gonna have a heavier weight because again, we're, we're multiplying those two things together to come up with this calculated metric. What makes our cumulative layout shift poor? Most of the time, it's ads. <laughs> it's a third party dynamically generated content. We are a content based site and we serve ads so you know, keep the lights on. And when that ad loads, it jumps everything around. We also see this come from images without dimensions. We see it from web fonts. So if you have a, a fallback web font that's being used, when it recalculates that, when that responds, it's going to make everything recalculate and shift, not great. So how do we make this better? Always include width and height, even if you don't know what the resource is gonna be. So you've got an ad slot, you know some content will go in there. Reserve that space, use a placeholder in there. Don't collapse it, even if it doesn't load. So your third party ad didn't fire in, that doesn't mean to shrink it back down again. You wanna keep that space because that keeps it and that was a blank wide spot, still better than the page jumping on um, jerking the user around. We wanna avoid inserting content above existing content. So this comes back to, let's prioritize how we load. My user cares about what's available on the screen in front of them. They don't care about the footer. They don't care about anything dynamically related below. Focus on what matters when it matters. And if I'm loading content that's going down there, 
on our footer and then adding the content my hero um, hero content that which my user came for above it i'm making everything shift avoid this so take care when you place non-sticky ads near the top of the viewport preload your fonts it's gonna be all right this guy's only five percent right now but interestingly almost every client i've talked to this is what they care about like oh but can the layout shift and honestly i get that this makes sense to be one to have on your mind's eye because no one likes this experience. There's a reason it's part of this ranking signal. All right, how to action on these. There are so many tools to test this. Where do we even start in this workflow? As SEOs, I recommend we start with the Web Core Vital test in Search Console. This particular resource has information that other ones don't, and it groups together problem pages for me. I love this. So if I know I've got some pages scoring poor because they're taking longer than three seconds to reach that LCP, if I click on that, I'm going to get a group of pages behaving the same. If I can identify what all of those have in common, I can fix them all in one go. This grouping is a beautiful tool. Once I've done that, go from Google Search Console over to PageSpeed Insights. And when I go to PageSpeed Insights, I'm gonna be able to get data from Crux, so our real user metrics, and from Lighthouse, so the emulated lab data, which helps us diagnose. Once I have that, I'm going to make a ticket. <laughs> Keep track of the work you do. It's valuable. Honor your time, honor the time of others, make that ticket, get the work done. Once that work's complete, let's test locally. No one likes to test in production. If you do, I don't wanna know what's wrong with you. You should seek help. Because in production, it's a whole new game. There's real life impacts. By testing a local environment, I can find out what's wrong and fix it before Googlebot is interacting with it, before my users are interacting with it. It's pretty great right there. Um, and you can run Lighthouse locally, which is one of my favorite things about it. It's available both in your browser as a portion of Chrome Dev Tools. It used to be called Audits, and with Lighthouse version 6, they actually renamed that panel to Lighthouse. Pretty great. Once it's all good and clear, then we push that to prod. If you're currently in a brainstorming state, I really recommend you check out web.dev. So if you are running Lighthouse, on your local browser, be wary of your extensions. They will impact how the reports come out. Web.dev kind of scrubs it away for you. It's very handy. You can also use webpagetest.org. So webpagetest, they're actually the guys that makes that help calculate speed index, which is another major component of, of Lighthouse. These all tie together. They do a great job in giving you multifaceted reports. They do waterfalls, they do ads, traces of stacks, everything you can want in one place. You can save those files, refer to them, easy repo steps when you see problems. If you're casually checking while you're working, there's some great browser extensions. Uh, there's Web Vitals from Addy, who is the hero of all of this, especially some CSS goodness. And we also have Pro, uh, Core Surf Vitals from Chris Johnson, which is a really cool little uh, tweak on this lets you see SERP information. So how will these ultimately come together and impact what you do and what you care about? Information is fun to learn about, but unless you can apply it, what does it mean? Well, 2021, this is a page level factor. It's not domain wide, it's on a page by page basis. There's no clarification yet whether this ranking signal is going to give you mobile or desktop data. My bet, mobile. We're moving towards a mobile only index. Every day we have new users on the web who are mobile only. And ultimately the thresholds for success are much uh, more challenging on mobile. So if we design for the smallest screen first, everything after that's gravy. Good news, AMP is no longer required for top stories. If you have great content and it meets these core vitals, you can be on that carousel as well without implementing a whole new code base to try and keep track of. <sighs> AMP was a fun thing and ultimately was designed to go, hey guys, you're shipping like 15 megs of JavaScript on every page. Can we just get the actual content? And that's why AMP was created. But now if we're using one core vitals and we're providing the experience that 
prioritizes the user, that still qualifies. That's eligible for here. We can expect this to evolve. That 5% of the score that is CLS going to go up. And Google's actually intending to update this on an annual basis. So every year, they're going to look at the metrics and figure out how do we refine these? How do we make them better? There won't be any surprises. They're going to let us know. These new metrics are going to be defined and documented similarly to how we've seen with web core vitals. Guys, imagine a world where we knew a year in advance about Panda or Penguin or any of these little other penalties. This is moving SEO from a, a land of mysticism and best guesses and reading the bones over to truly development driven. Google Webmaster team, sorry, Google Search Central team went from being its own entity to part of Google developers two years ago. And this really reflects on that. That's why we're getting such great documentation. That's why we've got amazing humans like the magical internet fairy that is Martin Split out there doing great tutorials, writing great documentation. We all want to make this work together. And it's the future of SEO. This is no longer the island of SEO and SEO copy and diff. It's a place where dev UX product and search engines are all overlapping, trying to make a better experience. It's pretty great. <laughs> Be brave. Be brave enough to suck at something new. It's okay if these things seem foreign and don't make sense yet. There's a great community out there that is excited to learn with you. If you are looking to take the stage and be one of those people who's excited to learn in public and help others learn, apply to United Search. I'm a mentor there. I would love to help see new diverse speakers up on stage. Let's do this together. And thank you so very much. I am Jamie Indigo, and it's been an absolute pleasure to share this time with you. Yay, thanks, Jamie. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. I've got a few questions that came in while you were speaking that I'm going to toss out there. So let's take five or six minutes for questions. And then I have a mm -hmm. few last call to actions to leave everybody with. Um, also, there were folks asking if the presentation and deck will be available. Yes, it will. So we'll make sure to get that circulated as well. All right, so I have two that came in from Emmer McCourt. The first one is asking if you could please elaborate on the learn how you know, Search Console messages can actually lead to data leaks or inform you about data leaks. Not Search Console messages. So when you are um, open up your browser, your Chrome, open up DevTools, you'll see a, tab, a panel called Console. And then there, there's, there's messages logged. So it's that not was, Search Console, it's- That was me on Search Console. Emmer was actually right. I miffed that one. But yes, so on console. Mm. So sometimes we record error messages. We keep track of data in there, and that can be captured. Um, I'm not going to go into super high detail there, because to be honest, I'm still learning a lot about security, and this one's a bit new to me. But when that deck goes out, there's a link there. Fantastic. All right, one more for Emmer. Um, so Emmer talked about how there were pages or, or fixes that are believed to be high, right? So mm -hmm. one is critical or above the fold CSS um, mm -hmm. not being found. Two are resources that do not specify cache headers. Mm -hmm. uh, and three was contains one or more single point of failure that can show up in SEO audit. So obviously they've been raising it with devs who've been ignoring it. Like we know this tale a bit. Yeah. Uh, so Emma wants you to weigh in on, on a scale of one to 10 <laughs> in their relationship to mobile page speed and UX overall. What would you say on a scale of one to 10? How important are these? So we're gonna start with a funny story about the time that I almost started a Gangs of New York style feud between myself, paid and DevOps <laughs> because there was a tool that required an iframe in the head. Yeah. I basically uh, negotiated that we would move it and if it showed improvement, then we would keep it out look for in search console or any of your tools when you see missing href langs, when you see missing canonicals, anytime there's a single point of failure in that head, like an iframe, like a third party um, resource that takes a really long time to respond, the head prematurely closes. So any of the important content beneath it, so your canonical, 
your title, your description, they're all missing. When I moved that iframe, I had a, I was working in a site that was several million products, many, many languages. And we went from having about a couple dozen href links tags recognized to over 110,000 in the course of a few days. Mm -hmm. It was a very quick turnaround. The integrity of the head, that's where every resource you need to make the rest of your page exists. If that third party resource, they're calling a single point of failure, it sounds like you're using site bulb just based on the languaging there. Um, if that can be deferred or made asynchronous, do it. Agree to make a, a, a test. Say, hey, I'm gonna measure it by this because if the head closes, that content's not generated and it can't be indexed. Just good communication there. What were the other two things? I got excited about protecting Yeah, them. yeah. Uh, critical above the fold CSS not found and resources ah. that do not specify cache headers. So Googlebot's really aggressive. They do not care about your max age. They're like, no, guys, do you realize, do you realize the tech debt it takes to crawl this every time you said it expires? It's the same reason they don't trust sitemap priorities or last modified dates because y'all kept lying, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Low priority on that one for sure. Mm-hmm. And then the CSS, if I could weigh in, I would say probably lower to moderate priority on that as well. Um, just try to make, you, you should always be planning for elegant failures uh, so that when something doesn't load, the site's still moderately usable or crawlable or readable. That's my take. That's actually my personal tagline, elegant failure. Elegant failure. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I wish my mom would add that elegant word, word on mine. <laughs> Uh, and I, so we'll say if anyone's using deep crawl, we have a, a new report that's around broken head items. Um, so if you're using an iframe or if you're using a body element, like a div tag, uh, we'll automatically flag that. Spans, spans will break the head guys. Spans will break the head. It'll just prematurely close that. Like mm -hmm. Jamie said, we try to honor what Chromium or what Chromium has, has put out there. We just said Chromio because best music in the world. <laughs> uh, but if you have not used deep crawl at all and you want to give a sample crawl a go, just let Jamie or I know and we can set yeah. one up. Um, I think it's really fun to kind of check out. So give us- a We're both on Twitter, terribly Sorry. annoying, it's sometimes amusing. Yeah, yeah, so you could pitch it to us there. Um, I've got one more question from William Axel. Uh, Hi, William. I'm just gonna read it here. I, I love the way it's worded and it resonated deep within my soul. So I've noticed that a lot of high authority sites, particularly news sites that get away with lousy mobile experience thanks to endless interstitials about cookies, newsletter ads and requests to send you notifications. Do you see this being more punished going forward or will eat and backlink factors always win out in a top fight for rankings in a fight for top rankings? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, my immediate response is I hope so. Because every time I go to one of those sites, I'm Sometimes I cheat and I just view the cache, <laughs> Google's cache version, because I'm like, I'm not dealing with your nonsense. Actually, I actually feel like you have really good insights into this one. Why don't you take it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that the thresholds will continue to nudge up, if not just from Google, but from users, right? Customer loyalty is at an all time low. Like, if you don't mind me saying so, they don't care if they can get the information elsewhere. And because of the way that the internet works and information propagates, someone else is going to offer what you have, whether it's a news story often or a product. Um, so I think that the patterns of users and their behaviors will start to dictate how Google will adjust their algorithms. Uh, I also think it's just plain rude. <laughs> I'm so sad to see that one of the biggest legacies from progressive web apps and the push from three to four years ago is truly just push notifications. Um, we just we met. No, <laughs> <laughs> please. I'm not marrying you yet. Uh, so that is just, I mean, yes, I think that hopefully users and high standards will keep nudging that I am often disappointed by the sites that rank high with really negative experiences, but put that into perspective because I do think that it truly has gotten better. Um, it's easy for me to gripe in the moment, but taking a look back, everything pre-2020 looked different. That was, yeah, it's been a weird year. Um, so yeah. And these factors are going to be reviewed once a year. They're going to look at how they're weighted, what components and metrics are involved. It's going to change and evolve. It will, and users will change and evolve. I would say keep submitting feedback too. 
Um, it's really not an anonymous system. Algorithms are meant to be, but they're developed by humans and those humans are, are reachable. Go do some snooping beyond just the main ones, but go talk about it. Put out talks about it, put out articles, submit feedback. Like public pressure is real, right? The squeaky, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So um, I would keep pushing on that one. And I, I hope that we can push some of those experiences down because they are downright frustrating, including some that come from SEO sites in our industry that develop news which is great, but they can be <laughs> I'm not going to name names. I'm not here to do that. I don't uh, think you need to. I think everybody who heard that was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's my day off. I'm only mean on work days, so catch me tomorrow. Uh, Jamie, is there anything else you want to add to your presentation before I get to some action items? No, no. I think 47 revisions is enough. Ready to move on. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, if you guys would like to catch up with us, with Jamie and I are on Twitter, we would love to hear from you. Um, go and check out our Core Web Vitals blog, our being Deep Crawl. So on the Deep Crawl site, there's a Core Web Vitals blog. Uh, we have also recently published a digital impact report. So ask 400 people about what the future of search and marketing will look like. And that's available for download on the site. Uh, we have another webinar coming up soon. Um, just check deepcrawl.com slash events, I believe, to keep an eye out for that one. But it's going to be on the new era of automation and something I'm very excited about. I'm going to give a quick peep. So we built a tool at Deepcrawl, really fantastic. And to me, it has evolved sort of the way that Salesforce has brought together sales and marketing or HubSpot has brought together marketing and SEO. This is essentially one of those pivot tools for devs in SEO. So tune in because it's going to be pretty exciting. And then again, we'll share the deck and the recording afterwards. And when we leave, there's going to be a quick two minute survey or two minute, I'm sorry, yeah. it's going to take you 20 seconds. You wouldn't mind just taking the survey to give us some feedback. So we know what kind of content y'all like. Um, that would be fantastic. That's how we get better. Oh, I do have one thing to add. When we share out this deck, there are uh, 10 or 12 slides in here all with resources, every link, every bookmark you might need as you're building that case to get improvements done, to get a ticket into dev, all at it because documentation or GTFO, yeah? Yeah, yeah, also sharing is caring. So keep finding smart things and keep sharing it with the community. All right, fantastic. Have a great Wednesday, everyone. Um, again, it's been a great pleasure. I'm glad you joined us and take care and have a good rest of your day.